Thank you for joining us for today's talk and tour of Rocky La Rocks, The Wild Inside. On behalf of the School of Creative Arts, I would like to acknowledge that SOCA and UFE are located on the traditional unceded territories of the Stalo people. We express gratitude to live and work on these lands. We are just about to start here. And as part of our welcoming and welcoming you to our event this afternoon, we have an opening drum ceremony. Joining us today is John Williams Cothiatel to start us off in a good way. John, let me introduce you again. How are you doing, John? I'm doing okay, thank you. Is uh, technical difficulties, but I found my way through. That's okay. So here he is. We finally have John Caulfiotel. And um, as part of our welcoming, again, we'll try this again. We have an opening drum ceremony for you. And uh, John will start us off in a good way. Hey, we'll see. Um, you know, I apologize for the uh, coming in a little bit late, but uh, I want to welcome you all to today's ceremony. And um, yes, thank you for being patient. Oh, Hope you have a good day. Thank you so much for starting us off in a good way, John. Um, folks, my name is Amy Henny Brown, and I, uh, in addition to thanking John for starting us off today, want to let everybody know that the chat function is active and available. Some of you have already tested that out. Um, so please know that if you have any questions as the talk is proceeding, feel free to enter your questions into the chat function for Zoom. That's normally found on your bottom toolbar if you're new to the Zoom space. And you can click on the chat function and it'll open up a window where you can type in your questions. And you just wanna make sure with your questions that you're choosing to send it to the panelists um, so that we can make sure to see the question that you are asking. Um, we'll have a dedicated portion of our talk today for answering questions from the audience. Uh, so I encourage everyone to stay so that we can hear um, from Rocky in person um, in relation to the questions you have about his work in process. Uh, I'd like to pass things over to Adrian and Rocky and the folks at the Reach Museum Gallery. Thank you, Amy. Can you hear us okay? We can. Great. So while the uh, slideshow is still going, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us today. My name is Adrian Bast. I'm the Curator of Art and Visual Culture at the Reach Gallery Museum. I'd like to thank the School of Creative Arts at UFB for organizing this event. 
Um, and I'd also like to express my thanks and gratitude to John uh, for starting us off in a good way with his beautiful voice and his drumming. Um, before we go any further, I want to recognize and acknowledge that the Reach is located in the unceded, occupied, ancestral Stolo territories of the Samath and Matansqui First Nations. We are incredibly lucky to have such generous Indigenous hosts, and I thank them for the fact that I am able to live and work in their territory, and I promise to do my best to be a good and respectful guest, albeit an uninvited guest, in this land which is their home. I'm very happy to introduce you to the artist Rocky the Rock and his artistic practice. He's the reason we've all come here today. Rocky was born in 1958 in Seattle, Washington. Uh, when he was about 12 years old, he moved with his mother and his siblings to her traditional Coast Salish territory where he still resides in the community of Staalis or Shehalis here in the Fraser Valley. Rocky has maintained a steady career as a carver for more than 40 years making work for businesses and private collections and carving welcome figures, benches, and other large scale work for band offices and schools. He also worked at the University of the Fraser Valley in 2008 and 2009 in the visual arts department as an instructor and a studio technician for the Indigenous Design and Technology Program. And for years, he also worked with at-risk Indigenous youth and with prison inmates as a counselor and a teacher using art as a means to recovery and wellness of mind and spirit. I was first introduced to Rocky and his talent as a carver through his involvement in the 2019 group exhibition that we had here at the Reach called We Yaxet, We Transform It. That exhibition featured the work of 14 indigenous artists all with ties to Stalo territory, including Rocky. Um, and it was clear to me after meeting and talking with Rocky and visiting his home and studio at Chehalis that the scope and quality of his career was deserving of a much larger, more dedicated platform than that original group show could accommodate. And that's what's led us to, to today and the current exhibition, which is the first time really that a breadth of Rocky's creative practice has been brought together and exhibited all together uh, at a public professional gallery. The exhibition opened on January 28th, and it will remain open until May the 8th. Uh, the response that we've been getting from our visitors to this exhibition has been so wonderful and really at times quite overwhelming. Uh, you've gotten to see some of these photos of the exhibition and the masks that are in it, um, but I want to tell you it does not compare to the experience of being in this space surrounded by all of these watching spirits, and I really highly encourage everyone who is listening if you can, to visit the Reach and to see the exhibition in person. I keep saying, I dare anyone to stand here and feel nothing. The work is powerful and moving, and it deserves to be appreciated in the flesh. Now, with that introduction out of the way, we can get to the fun part, where I get to just have a conversation with my friend Rocky. So we're going to stop the slide share at this point. And here we are in the exhibition space. I am Adrian, and this is Rocky. <laughs> so I'm going to ask some questions. Um, and then at the end, as Amy mentioned, we'll take some questions from the audience that have been typed into the chat function. So, Rocky, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so, I actually have a, an unplanned question, something that just came up. When you first came in the exhibition space today, and you've done this before when you've come back uh, and you take a few minutes to go and visit the masks, um, and you sing to them, and you sort of check in on them, can you tell me just what is that for? What are you experiencing? Why, do you, why is that important to you? Well, in our culture, in our ways, um, everything that we do, that we make, that we create, it has a meaning, it has a job. Um, when you make something so sacred, it has spirit, it has uh, hair, it has bark. It, uh, that mask is doing a job. And it's like in our culture, when you hang something on the wall, it says something, it means something, and it's doing something. Well, all the people that come in to the gallery here, they all stand in front of that piece and they'll look at it. And that piece is helping that person. 
it's helping them with their stuff. They don't know what they picked up. They don't know what they walked through. They can't see it. They can't hear it. But in this world we live in today, we live in a spirit world. Well, in the spirit world, people can't see spirit because spirit's invisible. Well, that mask, it's doing its job. It's uh, taking away whatever that person picked up that they don't even know they're packing. So that mask does, does its job, it has a job to do. And it's cleansing, it's purifying, and it's ridding all of the evil things that we walk through and we're around every single day. So I go up to that mask and I acknowledge that mask because it's alive. It was alive once and it's alive again. And it's doing its work. So that's what I'm doing. I'm acknowledging that spirit itself because I have a connection because I made it. It's, it's fascinating to me. It was, uh, you came to see the exhibition. Uh, you've been away for a couple, you hadn't seen it for a couple of weeks. And when you came back, the first thing you said as soon as you walked close to the space was you said, they've all changed. Uh, and I asked you what that meant and you explained what you just sort of said that all of these masks have been doing this work, helping every person who comes into the space without that person necessarily even knowing about it. And they're carrying all of that. So it's important to uh, also to cleanse the masks so that they can continue to do the work that they need to do. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do that. But it's it's interesting to me that every time you see the masks, they're they're new or they're different for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you started your career as a carver more than 40 years ago. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what led you to decide to embark on that kind of a career and some, some of who were your first teachers? Yeah, um, back in high school, I wasn't uh, exactly one of the straight A students. My uh, uh, brother in law, he was uh, married to my oldest sister, and he had taken a carving course at Kassan up in Hazleton up north. Well, one day he says, Rocky, he says, uh, you're not doing so good in school. He says, uh, why don't you just drop out of school and uh, come in and move in with us and I'll, I'll teach you how to carve. And I thought, well, that's, that's a plan right there. And what was his name? Well, his name was Ron Austin. And uh, so I, uh, I moved in with my brother and sister for a year. And uh, Ron taught me the basics of um, wood, of uh, knives, making knives. Uh, curved knives, chisels, uh, gouges, and uh, sanding and painting and stuff. And he taught me how to make uh, totem poles and masks and stuff. And uh, yeah, I've been doing that ever since. And how did you come to, to learn under um, Francis Horn as well? How did that come about? Well, a long time ago, back in the day, uh, I used to go with this. Uh, Beautiful young lady. And Francis Warren was married to my girlfriend's oldest sister. So, and he was a, a pretty well known artist back then, too. So, I, uh, I went and uh, did a lot of uh, projects working with him, like uh, not doing them the same, same piece, but he was teaching me, too. His, uh, his way, his style. And uh, yeah, you just pick up uh, a little bit of everybody's uh, way of doing things and uh, you end up creating your own stuff. Absolutely. It must have been difficult at times that oh, I imagine trying to uh, maintain a career, a livelihood for yourself as a carver, working with hand tools for all those years. Can you uh, talk a little bit about how difficult that was and perhaps what was it about carving and working with wood that kept you going? Well, um, we got uh, that saying, uh, starving artist. Uh, I know what that means. Because <laughs> it was, uh, 
it's a rough go sometimes with, uh, I guess, sales going to Vancouver and uh, going to all these different galleries and uh, getting spun around right at the front door. You know, sometimes uh, the, uh, the buyers, they, they take advantage of that. They, uh, they'll offer you something, they'll barter with you, they'll bicker with you, and uh, they'll know that you're uh, in a tough predicament. So uh, you have to take what they give you. And uh, yeah, I think uh, working with uh, the wood and going to the forest and going to the river was my go to place and working with wood and just being in the moment was uh, probably what kept me going, what kept me doing what I do with wood. It's, uh, so the wood itself and just being in the woods and being surrounded by nature and being able to be a carver, to the, it's a type of work that you can do in that environment, that that sustained you through some of the difficult times. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, I noticed too that um, in our culture, I was taught that uh, cedar is a medicine. Cedar is our strength. Cedar is our everything. Like we use it for everything, to do everything. The boughs, right down to the roots, and the bark and the wood itself. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a medicine just working with cedar because it gives you and it takes away what doesn't need to be on you. So they, they, they just go hand in hand. I'm thinking that some of the people who might be watching today might be students at UFB who are studying art and who are maybe thinking that they want to have a career as an artist. I was wondering if, if you could give advice to young people who are starting out today wanting to be an artist, what advice would you give? Oh, oh <laughs> yeah. Get a chainsaw. <laughs> Get a chainsaw. Good one, yeah. And um, be sure you got uh, safety first. Okay. You gotta have some shafts on, some steel toe boots, some goggles, some air moss. Safety first. And, yeah, safety's always first. But um, yeah, um, working with wood is, um, you never stop learning. You learn something every single day. Every piece that you make, you're gonna learn something. And with uh, with working with wood now, if you have the right teacher, you have the right tools, you gotta have the right attitude. You gotta be right up here and in here if you wanna make something, whatever you make, because whatever you make, or whatever you're creating, you're putting a lot of what's in here into what you're sculpting, what you're bringing to life. But most of all, it's what you're going through is going into that piece as well. So you have to be very careful where you're at up here when you're making something with your hands because it goes into what you're creating, what you're sculpting. So if you're in a bad place, or if you're not dealing with things properly in a good way, then you won't be able to make good art. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, those two go hand in hand too, but that's kind of a touchy situation too. Yeah. But at the, same, stuff. Yeah, at the same time, cedar being the medicine that it is, it, uh, it helps you what you're going through, it helps you Get over that hurdle so you can carry on with your life in a good way. So, in a way, it's not about being in a good place before you start the work. It's that the work itself, working with cedar itself, can help you get into a good place. Yes. Which is, yeah. That's probably why I've been carving so long. <laughs> Just always working on it, we're always a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Now, you mentioned chainsaws, um, and you touched on that a little bit. Um, I know that for many, many years, obviously, when you first uh, received your first mentorships, when you first started carving, you were using hand tools, using traditional hand carving techniques, and you did that for many, many years. Um, but in recent years, you've undergone something of a conversion, and you've really embraced working with chainsaws and other power tools. Can you tell that story about what it was that 
brought about that change and why you love chainsaws so much? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, a long time ago, I was sitting down at the restaurant having a meal. I grabbed the newspaper and I noticed uh, there was a chainsaw carving competition in Hope. So I uh, grabbed the phone and I phoned the guy down there that was in charge. And I asked him if I could get into the competition. And he says, sure, you got one spot left. I went, oh, right on. So I went down there with all my hand tools. Oh man, so embarrassing. <laughs> but I had all hand tools and 12 other guys, they had nothing but power tools, die grinders, trembles, chainsaws, everything you could think of moving wood really fast. So um, long story short, I, uh, I got threw away all my hand tools and I bought all power tools. So now I have like uh, a dozen chainsaws. Um, I have every tool you could imagine for every possible cut you could make. And for something that uh, used to take me a month, I could uh, whip it out now in a couple of hours because uh, because of power tools. <laughs> so is it the speed and the convenience? This is the how much easier it makes the work? Is that what why you, or is there something about chainsaws that you just really enjoy? <laughs> no, no, no. Power is uh, power is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After working with your hands for like 30, 40 years, you you start to uh, think about your grandfather. If your grandfather had the chainsaw, he would have got rid of the saw and the axe, and he would have used the chainsaw. So, uh, so uh, what the heck? I'm gonna do it too. I was thinking about uh, the kids. I was teaching in the school, and the kids were. Uh, wanted to use power tools. Well, some of these grinders, they kill like 12,000 RPMs and they got a grinding disc on them. Well, those are meat grinders. You touch them anywhere on your body. Meat grinders, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, uh, yeah, there was a couple of close calls at the school. <laughs> safety first. Yeah, so it was, uh, we better go safety first. Yeah. Teaching first, yeah. It's a trial and error, just like anything. Have you ever gotten hurt? Huh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have lots of uh, body mouth coming out of my mouth. Oh dear. Yeah. I think my foot will change, so I'm cut my leg. It's gotta yeah, you gotta be very careful. These are oh, yeah. very powerful things. Yeah, yeah. I need some uh, lots of safety first. What I uh, what I like one of the things that I like about the exhibition, what we decided to do, that one of the first masks that people can encounter when they go around the corner is that raven mask um, that's an older work of yours, something that you did on commission, you know, someone requested a, a particular uh, mask, um, but it's also, it's carved using the hand tools and the hand techniques uh, that you perfected, that you mastered before. Because I think sometimes that mask to me represents what I think sometimes some members of the public expect of contemporary indigenous carvers. They want it to look like that. But you said to me once, it's like, yeah, but that's a dime a dozen. There's like a million guys who can do that. But then, but I wanted to include it in the exhibition to show people that you're perfectly capable of doing that style of work if you wanted to. But then the rest of the work in the exhibition is new work that you've done with your power tools. And it's utterly unique. It's very, people recognize your work as a Rocky the Rock work. Like they can recognize it across the street, down the road. Uh, and that this work can be just as powerful, just as important, just as moving, just as uh, grand uh, used by made using power tools. It doesn't necessarily, as you say, your if your grandfather had a uh, chainsaw, he would have used a chainsaw. <laughs> so um, I think that that's a really important conversation. That's a part of contemporary indigenous art, particularly carving that uh, it can also embrace all of these new technologies and still be vibrant and important and valid. Yeah. That wasn't a question, that just me being a curator and spouting off. <laughs> um, now, I was lucky enough, before the COVID times, I was lucky enough to come out to your property in Chehalis a couple of times. And I think it's important for people to know that you carve entirely outdoors all the time in all weather. And 
all around your property, there are carvings in various stages of completion. And they're in the trees and they're on the ground and they're in the forest and they're everywhere. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit about what it was like for you when you first came into the gallery and you saw your work being displayed in the way that it is in the exhibition and how, how, what you're, how that felt to you to see them in such a different context? Well, <clears throat> when I walked in here and I saw these pieces hanging on the wall, I was stunned. I was floored. I was in awe. Like I have never, ever seen anything like this. But my stuff, um, like you said, uh, most of my stuff's just sitting on the ground outside or hanging in the tree or leaning up against the wall. Well, to see it on display is uh, kind of uh, put a lump in my throat, really. I was just so blown away by how I could work in something for so long and then all of a sudden come out of the forest and come to where the bright lights are and the painted walls and stuff and see my stuff hanging on the walls. It's just like it um, took on a whole new meaning for me. It, it just like it popped it was like a wow thing for me it was like i've never ever seen that before and it was like i just some little animal that just came out of a forest for the first time walked into the city and, you know it's, it's, i don't know it's just uh, breathtaking to me <laughs> well it's it's so interesting because some of these masks you know you they're like old friends you've had them around in your property for a long time and then you dress them up and you put them on the painted wall and suddenly it's like meeting an old friend uh but meeting them for the first time they look totally different <laughs> um so one of the things we tried to do in the exhibition was to try to capture a little bit the sense of what it's like what it was like for me going to your property and when we went for a walk in the woods behind your, your house and I could see carved faces sort of peeking out at me all over. So we painted the walls of the exhibition uh, very dark and soft green. Uh, we've hung the masks at all different heights and we kept the lighting kind of dark and moody. So to try to give the sense that you're kind of, you're in the woods behind Rocky's house and you're seeing the masks and the carvings the way I did. Uh, but it still looks like an exhibition. <laughs> it still looks like we're in a gallery. Um, what, so one of the last things that we decided to do with this exhibition, I remember I was on the phone with you a couple of days before and you asked me, what about music? And uh, we've obviously turned it down for the recording today, but normally if people come to the exhibition, there's some music that's playing, that's uh, music that was recorded out in your community in Chehalis, um, drumming and singing. Can you tell me why was that important to you to have music as a part of the exhibition space? Well, Back home, we have uh, four longhouses. And every winter, we help our own people with their lives, with their culture, with their way of living. We, we help them to uh, change everything about them. And we Helped them with the song and the dance and the choir. And those three elements to me are so important to distinguish who we are today as a people, as a, as a strength, as coming together and being one with the spirit, with the uh, wood water, with fire, that's um, all of the mother nature's elements. Those are like the strongest things in the world. And when we can uh, help these children that are going through stuff, that have been through stuff, or that are traumatized from other people's demons and uh, negatives and evils, and the list goes on of negative and bad things. Um, Longhouses, 
was, was my medicine, was my my help, my my creator, my everything. They taught me a new way of living. They taught me a new way of looking at things, hearing things. So I have to have the music, I have to have the drums when I'm doing the work. So I do that now on every morning. I yeah, I listen uh, to the flute, I listen to the, the big drum, I listen to the smokehouse drums, and I, I go to the forest and I do what they taught me in the longhouse, and that was to um, give thanks, to be grateful for what you have, to never throw food away, to save a little bit of food and bring it to the forest and leave it on the stuff. Face the east and give thanks for another day. Give thanks for our health, our well being. Roof over our head, clothes on our back, the shoes on our feet, the food we eat, and be grateful. So that's what I do every morning. And so I teach my children and the next generation. You know what I mean? Do you think that's you, you talked about the work that the masks are doing, that they are taking away a lot of the negative things off of visitors that the visitors might not even know that they're carrying. Do you think that the music is helping with that as well? Is that part of what's making the, the work happen in the exhibition? Well, of course, because um, I was taught that um, the drum, the hoots, the rattles, they call the spirit. When there's a drum playing, the spirits are already here. Well, when the drums are playing, the spirits, they go into each one of these masks. The mask, the spirit, comes alive. And when the music's playing, like the drums are going, the masks are doing the work. They're um, cleansing, they're purifying, they're helping whoever walks through these doors, whoever even walks past them. Helping that person with their whatever they picked up or whatever last year they did. But they don't want. Well, I think the exhibition has been really good medicine for all of us who work here um, and for our visitors. So it's the masks, it's the music, it's all of it together. And I, I feel the responses that we're getting from the public, and I feel it myself. Like it's it's as I say, it's a I you can't stand in the space and not feel something. It's uh, it's really powerful. I'm glad, that, I'm so glad that we have it right now because especially, you know, we're, we're hopefully in the home stretch, we're all going to get our vaccines soon, but this is a really hard and difficult time for everyone, including the people who work here. And I think your, your exhibition has helped us. Um, it's really been helping us get through all of this too. Um, there's several masks in your exhibition that are kind of split down the middle and they have one side that is like a skeleton like a ghost face, and another side that is more like a human face. Can you talk about why, what that, what the significance of that is to you? What is, what does that split face represent, and what is, what does it communicate to you? Well, <clears throat> to me, um, in this world we live in today, there's, uh, there's ghosts, there's spirits of uh, people from the past, people that have been traumatized. And some of them are still lingering. Some of them, they never went to the light. They're still here. They don't know they're gone. They'll just keep on doing the same thing over and over and over until somebody comes along and somebody that has the gift to see that, to hear that, to feel that. And for that person that's gone, that doesn't know that they're gone, that spirit has to be shown to the light. That spirit has to be told what happened. And what he has to do because just like 
people today, they don't, uh, they don't always know why they're feeling the way they feel or why things happen the way they happen. But in our culture, in our way, we have a gift to see, to feel, to understand, and to act on spiritual things in the spirit world because of who we are as stellar people. We have that wonderful connection with Mother Earth and the trees and the water and the fire and the plants and the animals. Being one with the creator's creatures and everything is so beautiful and so powerful to be able to connect with spirits that nobody else, not everybody can see is a, is a blessing in itself. It's a gift. So if we're, if we're always walking, you know, with one foot in the spirit world and one foot in like the human world, and many of us don't even know that we're walking in the spirit world, that there, it's a spirit world that we're a part of and we don't even know it. Is that, in a way, it's that the split masks is that sort of a reference then to maybe like the spirit world and the, the everyday world? Yes, that's um, I think, um actually means a lot of things really to yeah. me. Like all that. Yeah, you, you um, hit the nail right on the head there because in the spirit world, it's uh, somebody who used to be here, but now they're gone just because they're, they died and we put their body in the ground. Um, they're moving on to the next stage in their life. They're um, moving on to uh, another world. Like uh, my baby sister, she just passed. And uh, that was the hardest thing was to, uh, to witness my, my nieces looking at the mother. She was, uh, she's in the spirit world now. And I'm trying to teach her children about their mom's gone, but she's still here. She's still with me. She's with them every single day, every step that they take, but they still mourn for her. That's why I put some tears in these masks because I've been mourning for my baby sister. It isn't a day that doesn't go by that I don't think of her and think of her and pray for her and talk to her. Like, it's good that we can, uh, we still communicate. She comes to me in my dreams and we have a good time. We have a good laugh. We have embrace each other. And, uh, I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful that I, I live the life that I do now. So now, this year, on all these pieces, I make one side the spirit world and the other side is today. When we go out into the forest and we feed, we always make sure that we acknowledge Sasquatch, Sasquatch. We uh, bring him food. We pray to him. We give him fish, meat, plants, Berries, medicines, smoke fish, no smoke fish, just like you and me. <laughs> yeah, we just, uh, he's our, he's our go to guy. He's our dog. There's a beautiful and quite uh, uh, intimidating mask of Sasquatch Sasquets that has these amazing horns and feather and hair that's in the exhibition. I can see it from where I'm sitting. Um, and uh, I know that Sasquatch is, is very important to you, uh, that means a lot to you. Can you tell the story you've shared with me before, uh, the time that you discovered that maybe you thought you were feeding the ravens and the eagles, but it turns out maybe you were feeding someone else? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, one morning, um, it just snowed, and uh, I was on my usual morning truck out to the forest <laughs> with a bunch of uh, bag of leftovers, and um, I dumped all the food onto my stump, and I faced the east and I acknowledged 
creator and spirit and give thanks for everything. And on my way back home, I was just about home. And I looked down in the snow and there was a, there was an indentation in the snow. And I figured it was just the snow from the branch that you know, fell off the branch, and went into the snow. But it was shaped just like in a trap, like a, you know, a bear foot, but it was big. So I um, stepped back and I, I looked back and there was another one, another one. I looked forward and they, were, they went right to the front yard. And I was going, get out of here. Because <laughs> I figured maybe, you know how when, when dogs run, yeah. all four feet, they hit the ground at the same time. That's what I thought. Looked up the snow. Well, I went, followed the tracks back where I was, uh, went to feed, and the tracks started right where I was, uh, where I left the food on the stump. So I followed them back, and I don't know how they got ahead of me, but uh, I followed the tracks, and they went right to my front yard, on the side of the house, they went across the front yard, and walked back through the forest. Had a visitor. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that showed me right there that uh, I wasn't walking alone. I wasn't uh, only feeding Raven. And that told me that uh, the big guy is, uh, is real. He's a, uh, he can transform, he can shape shift. He could be whatever, whenever, wherever he wants, whatever he wants. You know, um, I heard uh, this elder speaking. He says, uh, this one time there was these kids, they were going down the river, they were going to fish. And one boy stopped and he says, I'm fishing right here. I see some fish jumping. So the other boy says, Well, I'm going to go further down the river. So he went down the river and on the trail, he heard his grandfather calling him. So he went towards where he heard his grandfather call, and he stopped and listened, and he heard it again. So he went further into the forest, and he was wondering, what did my grandfather get here? He was back at camp. So all of a sudden, he seen something huge in the forest, and it scared him. So he turned around and he just beelined her and told his buddy, he said, hey, he said, come on, let's go. It was the big guy. So he ran back to camp and his grandfather was sitting there. He said, what are you guys doing back here? And he said, well, um, I heard you calling me out in the forest. And he said, he's seen the Sasquatch. And he goes, oh. He said, the Sasquatch was, um, he was trying to lure you over to him. Using the grandfather's voice. Yeah, he was uh, mimicking yeah. something else. Someone was smart. Yeah, so um, that showed me um, there's, uh, there's lots and lots and lots of stories back home. Like all of the elders could uh, easily share a bunch of Sasquatch stories with me. So we don't um, we don't really uh, go around exploiting our own God because um, to the Coast Salish people, he's uh, he's like pretty much all we have left. So he's uh. We're not hunting him and we're not exploiting him and we're not, you know, trying to uh, make any money off of him. But you leave gifts for him, you leave food for him. Oh, so yeah. He knows where to find a meal. Every winter, we, um, every, every winter and every spring, all the longhouses make plates for him and we offer food to the Sasquatch to the ones in the past in the fire, the ones that are here today. And they get, uh, we spoil them all. <laughs> Fish, hearts, livers, works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also in the exhibition, uh, towards the end of the exhibition, one of the last pieces is a, a carving of a grizzly bear mask that was carved by your son, Cody LaRock, uh, who has also carried on with your tradition of carving using chainsaws and other power tools. And your, your other, your daughter, Nikki, is also quite an accomplished artist. Um, what does that mean to you that you're the next generation, that some of your children are also learning to express themselves with art making, with carving, with, with 
graphic design and those sorts of things. Is that important? Oh, yeah. It's um, to me learning and doing everything by hand. Like technology is uh, is amazing. But I'm just now learning about technology, the computer, power tools. But my kids, they seems like they were born with it because uh, I don't know how the hell my son did it, but he uh, <laughs> he bought a log. He got a company to rip it in the boards. He got another company to kiln dry it. He got another company to sand them down really nice and build tables. And then he drew a picture of a fish. And he got another company that does copper work to cut out the fish and inlay it in the table. And he got another company to deliver it. And he did not deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the director. That's my he's, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. He had the idea. That's yeah. what that is. So he did hire other people to get it done for you. Yeah, it's a lot. I did, wish I knew that 40 years ago. <laughs> But yeah, my kids are like, um, wow, like today they're, um, they're thriving, they're booming with um, in the arts. And it's just, uh, I don't know where they get it from. Well, and your little kids, your younger kids, you told me that you make them sit and draw and sketch, draw something every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I think I know where they got it from. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed um, when I was working in the school back home, and uh, I would watch the kids. A whole bunch of lazy ones would just go sit in the corner and just sit there and sleep. There's a whole bunch of them that were eaters that would always eat something. Over there, there was a whole bunch that were on their phone like all the time. I thought, oh, no, let's see here. I said, okay, okay, from now on, you guys have to draw something every morning when you come to class. And before you go to bed, draw something again. Well, I had these kids doing this for four years, and you should see some of them kids working now. Yeah, yeah they're like, holy crap, they're like, um, they're really good. Dude. There's one kid turned into a tattoo artist. Cool. Yeah, awesome. and he just he just does it from here. He puts it on here. Um, I'm teaching my son Luke right now. He's uh, thought he was five, but he said, <laughs> he, he got mad. <laughs> and I said, Luke, he said, um, Draw something, like anything. So he started, uh, he does it every morning. But him and his sister, they're like, uh, oh, I can't wait to, uh, and grooming them now, I'm sculpting them, <laughs> making them. It's a long term project. <laughs> My father, he was, he, was, uh, he was in the Navy and he was uh, very, very strict with me and my brother. And uh, we often wonder why. Now they know why, because uh, we're hard workers. We do hard work. And we don't beat around the bush. We don't take shortcuts or nothing. We were we were taught hard. It was a it was a hard life, but it was a good life. Now I'm doing that with my children. My kids think I'm really mean, but uh, no. It's, I tell them about our father, about what he did to us, and how he raised us. He said, I want to teach you everything I know before I go. And he did. I have a hard time thinking that you're mean to your kids think you're mean because you're such a softy. <laughs> you've got oh, such a big warm heart. <laughs> but are you, are you strict as a father? Are you strict with your kids? Oh, Try to be. I'm glad they're not here to answer that one. <laughs> oh, uh, I think you're a big softy, but that's, what, that's just me. Okay, next question. So, for many years, as I said at the introduction, you worked with um, at-risk youth, at-risk Indigenous youth, and with prison inmates as a counselor and a teacher. Can you talk a little bit about how you saw art being a tool that could help people in those sorts of circumstances? How can art help people in their paths to recovery? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, remember back in the day, teaching at the school, a lot of these kids, they were troubled youths. They were, um, they had sleeping problems. They had eating problems. Like they, they, they weren't eating right, they weren't sleeping right. And they were put in my pack. And I had to do something to help them along. 
So every morning, the great Lebanon falls and come in. I say, okay, you guys get in my truck. I said, we're going to the water. And I would uh, make them swim. And then I would make them sit down in the forest and I would teach them what I learned in the longhouse. Waking up your spirit, finding your spirit, and, uh, asking your spirit to, to guide you your way. And it was uh, just like day and night. Yeah, all of a sudden, these kids, they got it. They, they woke up. They, uh, this one boy that was uh, pretty bothered by like, swimming for like four years. And uh, one day, uh, the boss is, uh, Rocky, he says, uh, I don't want you bringing them kids for their spirit bath anymore. I said, what? He says, no, I don't want you to slip in. I don't know why. But I took the kids down to the water. I said, okay, you guys, uh, for whatever reason, I said, um, my boss don't want you guys going on your spirit bath. One boy said, yeah, that. <laughs> and he took off. This close, and he dove in the water. I got fired. Yeah. Well, anyway, long story short, this boy graduated. This boy has a job. This boy has a motorcycle. He has a truck. He's fine tuned. He's, yeah, he's uh, on the right path. He's doing all the right things. And it's, um, he's my proof that. What I was doing was right. I know it's something that's important to you that you go and we bathe in the river uh, and uh, take a dip in the water to uh, cleanse yourself to to get the brain moving to to be right with the world. Um, is that uh, something that you do fairly regularly and often? And how important is that to you? Well, yeah, back in the early nineties, I was initiated into the longhouse. And uh, my dad's are the, uh, they were pretty lenient on us for swimming every morning. And uh, we got used to that. Um, we found out that um, the devil, demon, he doesn't like cold water. <laughs> so, oh wow. Oh no, I don't yeah. like cold water either. <laughs> But yeah, the, uh, the cold water is it's it's even a, yeah, it's the key to uh, you got three quarters of your battle already lit. You can muster up the strength and the courage to go in that water and do your four dumps. Yeah, so it does a lot of the work for you. Oh yeah, you just get a bunch of the courage to jump in. <laughs> yeah, it uh, reprograms the computer real yeah. fast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I'm just um, sort of conscious of time here, and I want to make sure we have time for some of the questions from uh, audience members. Um, but before we go to the Q&A section of uh, this talk, um, there's something else I just want to make a, uh, an announcement. It's not a secret because we put out a press release earlier anyway, but it's important I want to acknowledge it today, that last month in February, the REACH received news from the Canada Council for the Arts that they have recognized Rocky's work as being a quote, outstanding artistic vision and quality, end quote, and that this exhibition makes a significant contribution to the arts in Canada. I submitted this application to the Canada Council uh, in the hopes of getting this recognition back in September. And I was hopeful, but I was also a little bit nervous because you've pursued your career for 40 years, but you've done so on your own terms. You've created your own career that is different from some of the usual contemporary art world channels. And I know that artists like you don't always get the kind of mainstream recognition that I think you deserve. So it really was important to me, it meant a great deal to me that the Canada Council saw and recognized in your work what I see and what I recognize in your work. Um, so I, I want to just acknowledge that we have a small gift for you. Um, this is from both the Reach and from UFB. 
Um, so I have here a blanket uh, designed by uh, Francis Horn Sr., your, your mentor, um, and a notebook for sketching, either for you or for your kids, and a small uh, pouch of tobacco. So we'd like to give you this gift as an acknowledgement of your accomplishments um, and to honor you. So this is for you. Well, thank you. Um, and I think that um, John uh, Williams wanted to do another song at this point uh, to, uh, to honor Rocky for this Canada Council achievement. So we'll turn off our video. Oh, 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 Good day. Congratulations. All my relations. So uh, now I think uh, Amy, who is uh, still present uh, in the background here, uh, has there been questions in the chat that you would like to pose to Rocky? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, John Katiatel uh, Williams, for uh, guiding us through our visit today with Rocky. Um, we have a couple of questions from attendees, and they're deep questions. So we might not have the time to answer all of them. Um, but I'd like to start with a question from Shannon. Uh, Shannon asks, how do you feel about the notion of art block or burnout? Uh, how do you deal with this in your practice? Do you ever have like writer's block or like you just find it difficult to make something? Do you get blocked or you can't figure out how to, how to make something? Do you, do you ever get blocked? <laughs> well, um, sometimes I get that, but most of the time, my drive for making stuff never shuts off. <laughs> That's probably why my yard is just full. <laughs> I went to the dentist one time and I looked and there was somebody on every chair. And behind the secretary, there was hundreds of folders. And it was my turn to go get my teeth fixed. And I went in the bathroom and there was somebody in every chair. And just one guy. I thought, holy smokes, one way you guys are rich. <laughs> so I made it a point to, um, every time that I went to the forest, I'd bring a chainsaw. And every time I fed Raven, I would carve something while I was out there, whip something out. And pretty soon, uh, yeah, my yard got filled up with carpets. So I don't get bored of uh, just working on one. I get, I get sick of one and jump on one. But I think it, it's easy, it would be hard for you to not make things. I don't know if you could actually stop. You're always wanting to work out, even if one thing is working out, as you see, you switch to something else, but you're still always working. You're still always making something. Yeah, this, uh, that, uh, I used to get burned out yeah. quite a bit. And I noticed that uh, I had to reprogram. I had to download different avenues of 
Where did I get that energy from? Why did that energy leave? What's making this happen? I had to reprogram and download what was good and get rid of what wasn't good. And therefore, I had to change and develop my own good, steady work habits and feed what was feeding me my drive and get rid of what was bringing me down, what was holding me back. And it was all up here. And in here, you have, everything has to be right before you can uh, pursue whatever you're going to make. If you're going through some crop, that crop is going to go into what you create. And what you create is you're going to try to sell that piece to somebody that's full of your negative. <laughs> that's not going to happen. But if it does happen, then um, that piece that you sold that person, they're going to pick up on all your crop. So you gotta make sure you're right up here and here before you attempt anything. And I imagine that, as you said, three quarters of the work is done for you if you can get yourself into the water and do your four dunks. And I know that being initiated into the longhouse for you really helps, as you say, I think embrace those things that are feeding you and lifting you up and, and throw away those things that are holding you back or that are burning you out. Um, and that's uh, for you. I think that was essential. I'm not sure that's advice we give to another artist, but I know it's been important for your career. Oh yeah, things have to be right. You have to be right in every aspect of your life. You can't just uh, look at yourself. Oh, that's nice. I'm gonna make one of those. <laughs> uh, it's not like shopping. It's uh, yeah, work. Okay, is there another question, Amy? Absolutely. And so I'm also going to let folks know that I'm just dealing with questions first come first serve. So I'm sorry if we don't have the chance to get to your question. Um, but Megan was asking and wondering what your experience has been like sharing your work with others through this particular exhibition, Rocky. Um, Megan's asking, has it been exciting or even stressful? Were there reactions you didn't expect or reactions to your work that you anticipated and you haven't received yet? And as a side note, Megan's saying, considering how shocking it is to see these old friends, these spirits in this environment, do you think you will con to continue to share your work in this kind of public capacity? Uh, um, yes, this, uh, this first show of what I do is uh, it's, it's blown my mind. It's, uh, it's like a whole new ball game. It's like a whole new world to me. But at the same time, the COVID thing is, uh, in a way, I, I'm kind of, kind of glad because I'm not one for uh, publicity. I'm not one for being in front of a camera, I'm not one for speaking, period. Um, to me, this uh, this show is just, uh, it's like just the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's a teaser for me. Like at home, I already have the next 25 masks ready for the next show. Like I, the next one's gonna be birds, it's ravens, eagles. You talked about you. You designed a, a kind of a, a bird uh, mobile for that for we uh, us to use in our education programs. And then you were walking around in the in the great hall here, looking up at the rafters, thinking we could build a big one and we could hang it from the ceiling in here. He's already thinking about his next exhibition. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, it's like that dentist. It's like there's so many clients, so much things that we can do that the work is is endless. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. I'm, I'm so humbled to uh, to give thanks and great greatness to the spirit to for this gift that Creator has blessed me with. To um, it's just uh, the ideas they, they never stop. They're, they're just constantly moving. And I I can't keep up. I feel like we've just started the next phase of Rocky's career. I feel like this is like the beginning of something that was going to go on from this, that we've just given him new ideas. <laughs> yeah. 
is there another question? A third one? Absolutely. Um, so from Brenda, Brenda's asking if you can speak a bit about the work that was on the invitation. There is a root or vine circling the head, almost like a halo. And Brenda's saying she's not sure if it's the same work in the exhibition, but the root or halo has been removed. Is it not there? Um, and she wanted to also let you know that it's a tremendously moving work. So, so she's talking about the, the mask right there. So we, that was a mask, that was the mask that Rocky had in the exhibition in 2019 that was called We Yak Said We Transform It. Um, and uh, when it was shown in that exhibition, it had, you might remember, it was that, wool, or that, that piece of driftwood that was uh, uh, resting on the forehead that was uh, um, a, a part of the work at that point. But when we showed it in this exhibition, I'm not sure what happened to that component, but we made some other changes, like we put in a light behind the crystal ball eye um, to sort of uh, make it a little bit spookier. And there's a number of works in the exhibition that you've added to or taken away from. You add antlers or horns, you take them away, you add hair or take away feathers. So in a way, I feel like a lot of your masks are always changing. They're, 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 they're not just, finished at one point and then they're done forever. You like to revisit them and change them from time to time. Is that true? Yes. Um, the um, piece of wood that's shaped like a halo and it's uh, put on top of uh, the mask. Um, that halo, that circle is uh, a part of our culture. It's a part of, part of our medicine, our belief. We use that in ceremony, but the ceremony, I, I can't speak anymore on that because uh, that's uh, way too sacred for, uh, for the public to hear or to know. So I'm sorry, but um, we can't exploit our own medicine, our own gift from creator. But I will tell you that um, it is a part of um, the job that each piece has to um, to heal and cleanse, to get rid of what we don't need, what is not meant for us. But uh, we walk right through it in our everyday walk in our life. And in our culture, all of these things that are added on the masks, they're, um, they're doing their job. They have a job. And, Amy, I'm counting on you to, to tell us when we, we uh, can't do any more questions, but we'll keep taking them for as long as, as long as we have time. That's actually a perfect segue. Um, we are at close to finish. Um, I, I would just like to say thank you so much for taking the time to answer the questions. And if, uh, Adrian, if I can ask you to invite John to close us out for the day um, and just let people know um, that afterwards, um, that will be the end of our, our talk and tour. So I, I would like to also say thank you. I'd like to say thank you to Rocky for coming and being a part of this. It's been a real pleasure working with Rocky and I look forward to doing so for well into the future. Uh, but thank you for today. And I'd like to invite please John Williams to come back and to close out the event uh, with another song. And we thank you very much for, for guiding us, as you say, through this event today in a good way.
I'll see you. Bye, out. All my relations. Have a good day.